when precluded from testifying, attempted to bring evidence. To say, well, let, you won't let us testify, you won't let us be heard, you won't let us face the investigators who talk to someone who talked to someone else, at least, at the least, would you just accept our package of evidence? Would you accept it so at least you can consider it, so you can, if, you, if you're sworn to do the right thing and uphold the law and do the right thing for the people of Texas, would you accept it? They would not accept it. Every impeachment that has occurred in the state of Texas has allowed the respondent to produce such evidence and the respondents have done so. There wasn't even a written report in this case. Now I want you to think about that. Would you not expect that if you're going to impeach or attempt to impeach a statewide official that you would not only have witnesses who are under oath, who testify, but that you would also have documents that you rely upon and that you would also prepare a report so the people of Texas could say, oh, House, now I understand what you did. There is no report like that. And we're all left guessing. What is going on? And as an aside, you know, the lawyers who were hired immediately after the impeachment, who immediately did a podcast, I listened quite carefully to the podcast, and one of the things said in the podcast one of the lawyers said, oh, there were crimes. And the other lawyer said, oh, no, no, no. No, no, we're not suggesting there are any crimes. We're not suggesting that at all. That's because there are no crimes, obviously. There are, have been no crimes. And the lawyer made the case on the podcast that, well, yes, there's no crimes, but he can be impeached anyway. That is not how it works. That is a violation of process. That's a violation of due process. In the Paul Ferguson impeachment that occurred 100 years ago, it occurred after an ex extensive public, public investigation by a House Select Committee. Three weeks, three weeks of testimony, not four hours from investigators who talked to somebody who talked to someone else. Every prior impeachment involved documentary evidence provided by both sides, that is, the people seeking impeachment and the individual's team attempting to be impeached, so there would be a fair airing of what it is we're even talking about. I would respectfully suggest to you that the people that voted on this may not have even understood what they were voting on. I'm going to introduce uh, Dan Cogdell, uh, a person you likely know who's been involved in some of the, the, the most important and widely publicized cases in our state and elsewhere, who's going to visit with us a little bit more on process, and then we'll come back and talk about a few more things as far as going forward and what you are likely to see next. Dan? Thank you. Thank you, Tony. My name is Dan Cogdell. I'm one of the lawyers representing Ken Paxton. It's, uh, it's refreshing to know that I'm probably the least recognized lawyer so far involved in this case, so I got that going for me. Um, I really became interested in getting involved in Ken's impeachment hearing. As some of you may know, I represent him on the ongoing state criminal securities fraud investigation or indictment. We're going to get there. But I really became interested in getting involved when I saw Representative Murr, who is the chairman of the committee investigating Mr. Paxton, trot out like they were the homecoming king and queen of his high school, Mr. DeGarren and Mr. Hardin. Now, make no mistake, uh, Rusty Hardin is probably my best friend that has a bar card. He and I are close. I respect him greatly, but that doesn't mean he's always right. Mr. DeGaren is a great lawyer. He's a legendary lawyer. He's an icon. Just ask him and he will tell you, but all of that is true. He is an outstanding lawyer. But to have those two great lawyers, first off, Rusty comes out, as only Rusty can, and says, the evidence is ten times worse than you thought it would be. 
Well, a reasonable person might ask, well, if the evidence is 10 times worse than I thought it would be, why do we need you <laughs> to prosecute the case? But in any event, they did say some things that I agree with when they were on the podcast that Mr. Busby refers to. M Mr. DeGaren said that they want to bring fairness to the process. I agree with that because what happened before the investigative committee was anything but fair. Mr. DeGaren said, we want the rules of evidence to apply. No kidding. So do we, because they didn't apply before the House. He said, we want due process. No kidding. So do we, because there was no due process before the House. We want Paxton to be able to compel witnesses to testify on his own behalf. So do we, because guess what? That didn't happen before the House. He said, we know the importance of transparency and we want to see it here. Guess what? So do we, because there was no transparency before the House. Mr. Hardin, my friend, said that he wants to ethically and fairly pursue the accusation. I agree with that. As, a, as a, not a side note at all, I want to echo again what Tony said, Paxton is innocent of these accusations. Let's not let that get lost in the weeds. He is absolutely 100 percent innocent of the accusations. Rusty said he should be able to cross-examine our witnesses. No kidding. We should, because that didn't happen before the House. He said we want fairness and we want transparency. No kidding, because that didn't happen before the House. I don't want to say it was a sham of a mockery of a proceeding before the House, but it was a sham and a mockery of a proceeding before the House. As Tony alluded to, if you look back at history, there's only been, th I think, three times that we've had uh, an impeachment proceeding that had any traction. The most recent one, to my knowledge, was O.P. Carrillo. That was in 75. Uh, Mr. DeGaren and Mr. Hardin were both licensed in 75. I was not. Uh, it, it also, look, I'll have those guys in the room with me any time because it makes me at least the third youngest lawyer in the room. I love the guys for that and that alone. But Mr. Mr. Carrillo's uh, hearing before the House lasted four months. Four months. This hearing lasted four hours. You see the difference afforded a district judge who I think, I could be wrong, but I think that district judge had already been convicted in the criminal case before he was impeached. They afforded a district judge a thousand times more time in his uh, impeachment proceeding before the House than he did Ken Paxton. In the Carrillo case, in the Ferguson case, there was sworn testimony. Guess what there wasn't in our Attorney General's case? Sworn testimony. In Mr. Uh, in O.P. Carrillo's and in the Ferguson case, there was notice to the accused. Paxton had no idea that this committee was investigating him. Think about that. Our elected attorney general, elected not once but twice, had no notice that this investigation was going on. And I air gesture because calling it investigation gives it legitimacy that it shouldn't have or it doesn't have. Korea was given an opportunity to appear. As Mr. Busby suggested to you, guess what? Ken Paxton wasn't given an opportunity to appear. Carrillo, Ferguson, given an opportunity to present his own case. Guess what didn't happen with Ken Paxton? Yeah, an opportunity to present his own case. Look, again, I, I respect and admire Mr. DeGaren and Mr. Hardin, but they both said it's not about politics. Really? Are you kidding me? This wasn't about politics. Those words came out of their mouths. Look, they're, they're good lawyers and good friends, but they're smarter than that. Uh, last I checked, all the members of the House are politicians. The rules are being drawn up by members of the Senate. Last I checked, all the members of the Senate are politicians. It's going to be presided, this trial, over by our lieutenant governor who, again, I respect greatly, but the last time I checked, he, too, is an elected politician. To say this case is not about politics has the credibility 
the believability and the sincerity of the fellow that's trying to convince his wife that he goes to the strip joint for the food. It's not about the naked women, sweetheart. It's about the food. Nonsense. It's definitionally political. Nonsense. In the committee, as Mr. Busby referenced, and I, I know well, Ms. Epley, Mr. Donnelly, Ms. Buse, Ms. Cameron, know their investigator. I've known them for years. But to call this any sort of investigation that warrants any merit, they interviewed 15 people. Do the math on that. There are 20 articles of impeachment. They didn't even interview everyone associated with at least one article of impeachment. Much of this, as you know, uh, involves Mr. Pacton's relationship with, with Nate Paul. Guess who they didn't try to interview? Nate Paul. Uh, guess who they didn't try to interview as well? Oh, yeah, Ken Paxton. Oh, well, they'll say that Mr. Paxton was represented by counsel and he wouldn't have let us interview Ken Paxton. Well, I won't now, based upon the fairness you didn't show me before, but you know who they did interview? Oh, yeah, Brian Weiss. So they have the time to interview the special prosecutor in Mr. Paxton's state criminal case, but they don't have the time I was literally speaking to Erin Epley during the time she was investigating my client. Again, I like her, I respect her, and there's not a shot at her. But to fly by the opportunity to talk with one of Ken Paxton's lawyers while they're talking to one of the, one of the, one of the special prosecutors is just absolutely, absolute hypocrisy. I don't want to turn this into a battle of the personalities and a battle of the legacies and, and all that silliness. What I want is fairness. What I want is objectivity. What I want is transparency. What I want and what you should want and every single person that's elected in this state should want is absolute transparency, opportunity to be heard, opportunity to cross-examine, opportunity to present witness. All we are looking for is fairness because it didn't happen down below. It didn't happen before the House. All we're asking for is fairness, period. End of story. Anthony, could you show me that last slide? One of the articles of impeachment, and this one really got my attention. See, never give a 65-year-old guy anything to do with technology. He'll pull it up, but here's the point. One of the articles of impeachment focus on Paxson's obstructing justice by not quickly resolving or resolving his uh, existing state criminal case by causing protracted, it's a good thing I don't drink anymore because that would throw me off, <laughs> by causing protracted delay <coughs> of the trial. Um, we have a word for that in the state criminal courthouse. It's not a word I'll say here, but it begins with bull. Uh, look over the record in the Paxton existing state security trial. Find out how many times we moved, that is the defense moved for a continuance. None, not one time have we ever moved for a continuance. The delays, almost without exception, are the fault of the state. Mr. Weiss, who they interviewed, has had this matter on appeal for almost three years, almost three years on getting paid or not. And they have the temerity and they have the balls to say that Ken Paxton obstructed justice by causing protracted delay? Come on, read the record. Did we file some motions? You're damn right we filed some motions. That's what I do. But for them to say he obstructed justice or caused protracted delay is utter nonsense. If that doesn't give you a window into how unfair this proceeding was, I don't know what will. I'll lower my blood pressure now, but that's just utter nonsense. To have an elected attorney general, not once, but twice the people have said, that's our guy. And this is the allegation based on nothing it's less than nothing. 
It's a lie. So I don't want to keep any, any, any more time for Mr. Busby, but I'll conclude by saying this. Mr. Paxton did not hire me because we lean the same way politically. He hired me to get him fairness. He hired us to get him fairness. He hired us to get him justice. And I intend to do just that. Thank you. You can see that, that when one of the, I'll put that back up there. When one of the articles says something that is so demonstrably false, and we know that they interviewed the prosecutor who's, who has brought the case, but not the man who has defended the case, had, had Mr. Cogdell been asked, and they were said, hey, Mr. Cogdell, is it true what Mr. Weiss says that because we interviewed him, not under oath, but we interviewed him, and he says that you've delayed this case, Mr. Cogdell would have probably said exactly what he just said in front of you, which is that is complete bunk. It didn't happen. But yet, that's one of the articles of impeachment. Let's talk about another one. You know, as I reviewed the, the 20 articles, and I don't even like to call them articles of impeachment because some of them are nonsensical. Some of them, it's impossible to even know what they're referring to. It's like they were written, some of them, like they were written by a third grader. It's hard to understand what the allegation is. But one of the allegations, you may recall, I think it's Article 10. Um, and I'm not going to get into each and every article. We'll do that at a later date. We'll do that at a later date when, once we know the rules uh, as we, we get them from the Senate. But I want to just demonstrate another one just so you can understand and the people can understand. Most importantly, the people of Texas can understand what the allegation is. Article 10, put up that picture, please. In Article 10, it's suggested that an individual named Nate Paul paid for renovations at the Attorney General's Austin House that included granite countertops. Do you remember that article? The granite countertops article? Do you see the, the countertops? Is that any sort of granite you've ever seen? This is, it, take, it would take a second grader five seconds to say, oh, that can't be true. That can't be true because it's not true. This is a picture of his kitchen. Part of that article is that an individual named Nate Paul paid for the renovation. So let's lay aside the granite countertops. Clearly that's false. But that he paid for renovations. Put up the receipts. We have the receipts. This is the type of evidence we tried to offer them. Once we found out this foolishness was going on. Receipts. Put up the other one. Of the payments for the renovations and the insurance claim. Listen, if we've come to a point where not only are Republicans fighting against Republicans and Democrats fighting against Republicans, that we will have a sham like this that's done in a three-day period with only a four-hour hearing based on hearsay upon hearsay upon hearsay, where then a man who was elected by the people with all this foolishness vetted already in the press and in public filings, that they could do this in secret. And when, we, and when General Paxson's uh, team found out about it, go there and say, look, we got documents for you and we'd like to be heard. And be precluded from doing so. Every elected official in the state is at risk if this is how things are going to be allowed to be done. And I don't think the people of Texas are going to allow that. I don't know what the reason was. I don't know what the reason was for them doing this the way they did it. I would suggest, had they done it the right way, there would be no articles of impeachment. Had they done it with a public hearing, with testimony, sworn testimony and evidence, there would be no articles of impeachment. 
Representative Smithy of the House said it best, and I'm going to quote him. He correctly characterized this process as hearsay within hearsay within hearsay. He told his colleagues on the floor, no prosecutor, no legitimate prosecutor, no credible prosecutor would ever even try to get a grand jury indictment based on this kind of foolishness. You know, the old saying is you can indict a ham sandwich in the state of Texas. On this evidence, you couldn't even indict a ham sandwich. He also said, what you're being asked to do today, folks, is to impeach without evidence. It is all rumor. It's innuendo. It's speculation. If all the things that we may speculate to be true but we don't know don't have what is defined or what qualifies as evidence in any court of law, in any court of law, not only in the state of Texas, but in the United States, in any court, this would not satisfy any proper process. Now, the way the House has done this, they are essentially attempting to, to tell the Senate how it should do its business. You've heard that, you heard some of the, the a couple of the lawyers for the House say, oh yeah, there'll be a full airing. Uh, that'll happen in the Senate. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. I would suggest the Senate will do what the Senate will do, and we eagerly await the rules because the rules will dictate how this proceeds. But the way I would like it to proceed is to submit it on reports. <laughs> submit your report. Prepare a report. Submit a report. It will be dismissed summarily. Not even traffic court would accept this kind of foolishness. The Speaker's done great damage to the institutional reputation of the House of Representatives. And now it seems, by them doing it this way, they're trying to dictate the way the Senate will do its business and doing damage to the Senate. We plan to follow whatever process we were given. We would urge the Senate to follow the rules of evidence and rules of procedure, because if the rules of evidence had been followed, if procedure had been followed, we all wouldn't be here in this room. Now, let me say this as an aside. I've seen some of you report this, this silliness with regard to lawyers and, and, and you know, the personalities involved. You know, this isn't a basketball game. Okay. Uh, this isn't sport. This is serious. And what the House did is not serious. But now it's become serious. The House realized just how weak their case was almost as soon as it happened. Maybe it happened and they were surprised it happened. So they went out and hired two of the, of the known great lawyers in Texas. These lawyers made their bones by successfully representing some of the most notorious and famous alleged wrongdoers in Texas. I've never been called upon to represent somebody who allegedly killed someone, cut up their body, and thrown through it in the Galveston Bay. But I have spent my career representing victims and representing states, and in some cases, federal governments, on serious matters. This is not about the lawyers. This is about the rule of law. And I know you'd like to talk about and focus on the legal matchup, the lawyer matchup, and all that silliness. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to let these legal legends off the hook. I'm not going to let them off the hook. I, I, this is a sham impeachment. And if they were being reasonable and fair, they would say the same to you. It was rushed in 72 hours with a four-hour hearing. And we've talked about no witnesses, testimony, or documents, hearsay. It's very disturbing to me as a lawyer that this could happen in our state of Texas. I have heard Mr. Hardin and Mr. DeGuerin, even when I was a child, say, process matters, evidence matters. There shouldn't be a rush to judgment. All the things that I've heard them say as a young person and as a young lawyer, you're, you don't hear them saying it anymore. 
How many times have we heard Mr. Harden say, that's the most outrageous thing I've ever seen? This is one of the most outrageous things I've ever seen. And now they've been hired to try to buttress this weakness and play some tomfoolery with you to prop up a sham. They spent their entire career saying that facts matter, not to believe everything you hear in the press. Testimony is evidence. Hearsay is not evidence. It begs the question, where is the sworn statements? Where are the transcripts of testimony? Not, I heard from this person, from this person. Where is it? You want to remove a statewide official. No, you learn in law school, first semester, this is not the way things are done. To say I'm heartened by this impeachment means you have disregarded the rule of law. They can do better than that, and I'm going to encourage them to do so. And so we ask the Senate, look at this foolishness. Look at what has been put in front of you. If you even consider it, because no court of law would, no court of law in this country would even consider it, but if you decide to consider it, it should be thrown out in a one-page motion. It should be thrown out, as we say, on motion practice. Not any judge sworn to uphold the Constitution of this country would ever count this, case, would ever even consider this. The rules are supposed to be transparent, fair, and everyone's supposed to have an opportunity to be heard and to respond and rebut. All that being said, if this isn't dismissed summarily, then we are girded up for a fight. Make sure you understand what I'm saying here. If this isn't dropped on papers, on motion practice, we're girded up for a fight. We've already identified 66 witnesses that will need to be deposed, that sworn testimony will need to be taken from. There will be thousands of documents. When somebody comes at you and makes these kind of silly allegations, we will have to prove them wrong, I guess, because apparently the way it works in the House is you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. We will do that. If we have to do that, we will do that, and we look forward to doing so. We're going to stand, and we're going to stand firm. And the one takeaway I want you to, from this, the whole thing's a sham, engineered by someone with a personal vendetta against Attorney General Paxton. And if it takes us a year to show that, then we'll take a year to do it. And to suggest that we can have a trial in August, I would suggest if we're going to have a real trial, if we're really going to have a trial, it's going to take a lot longer than that. I would also suggest that if we're going to have a real trial, we've got a lot of work to do between now and this August or maybe next August. I'll take a few questions. You and um, others, no AGL, not others, but people associated with Mr. Paxton have kind of focused on this tile versus granite thing. This is the actual committee transcript, and I would love to hear your thoughts on it. During that conversation, General Paxton relays that he wants an upgrade to the granite countertop. So I think what they're saying is that the upgrade was being made to the granite. Well, what, what hold up saying. a minute. Wait a minute. This is what your interpretation is of what they're saying? You know what we could know? How about if we had a witness? How about, let me just, let me think. Law school 101. What if we had a witness? Witness. Swear to tell the truth. I swear to tell the truth. Tell me what was said. Here's what was said. Cross-examine. That is tomfoolery. Anybody else? How do you think, should Senator um, Angela Paxton recuse herself in the trial? Each senator makes that decision for themselves, and I can't speak for her. Anybody else? Has Attorney General Paxton retained you himself, and how is he paying for this defense? I'm not being paid by the public. That's all you need to know. Anybody else? Paid by the campaign? Yes. If this is at the Republican Party of Texas headquarters, are, is it fair to say they're paying you? No, that's not a fair statement at all, no. Anybody else? I gotta take one more. How are you doing? You said you identified 66 witnesses. Uh, do any of them include sitting senators who may act as jurors? A juror, a juror cannot be a witness, and I'll just leave it at that. All right, I think that's it. Thank you for your attention. So what mechanism would you have to ask for a delay in the trial? We're gonna find out when we see the rules, and we eagerly wait to see those. All right, thank you guys. Appreciate it.